Welcome to Small Moves for Big Topics, transforming hard conversations into learning opportunities. And what we hope is that this session is a good follow-up of the two plenaries that happened uh, this morning, and to really talk about the small uh, moments in the classroom that take a conversation where students share their, their thoughts, take dialogue, and really turn it into learning opportunities. But first, we're going to um, do a little bit of introductions. Hi, everyone. I am Robert Hausman. I am a research associate and pedagogical fellow with the Learning Incubator at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. I am also a lecturer in applied physics, um, very interested in education as intersection with engineering and applied math in particular. Uh, my name is Karina. I'm the Associate Director of Course Design and Pedagogical Innovation at HBS. Uh, I'm also an instructor at Harvard Extension School. I teach uh, designing online experiences. So Robert and I uh, planned this session with our amazing panelists, uh, and we thought a lot about, we too both come a world of course design and learning design, so this is sort of the biggest goal of our, of our session today. So our three panelists today are, actually, I'll let you introduce yourselves. Uh, Amy, why don't you go for it? Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Hollander. I'm the director of a postdoctoral fellows program called the Curriculum Fellows Program over at Harvard Medical School. Uh, we train amazing STEM PhDs in becoming awesome educators. So if you're hiring, let me know. And I'm also a lecturer in the microbiology department. Hello, my name is Iram Alam. I'm an assistant professor in the history of science department, and I focus on history of medicine. And my work is a lot on medicine migration, and I teach broad courses on the history of medicine and health in the United States. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Weinsroll. I'm on the faculty of the Business School, and I currently serve as Senior Associate Dean and Chair of the MBA program. Uh, and I'm an economist by training and uh, went to the college and GSAS. So I've been here a long time uh, and experienced lots of teaching and learning, I guess, at the university. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. So what we're going to start off today is to uh, give you all an opportunity to uh, reflect on this question, uh, which is something that we we came into this panel really thinking about. Uh, what is the value of bringing controversial or hard topics into the classroom with purpose. Uh, and so if you see uh, the QR codes on your table, you can use that to answer the question, uh, or you can scan the QR codes on the slides. And we'll give you a couple of minutes to put in your responses. All right, we're going slideless in service of the no devices in the classroom comments from this morning plenary. This is all on purpose. Okay. So a lot of amazing um, insights that you all have about what is the value of bringing controversial or hard topics into the classroom. Uh, one is to help students become more open and understand differing points of views, help them humanize from different from others, um, the opportunity to think and see beyond their own perspectives, uh, and to lean into the educational mission of knowledge creation. Prepare them for real life where you cannot avoid it. So that's a really big thing, right? And that's something that we're going to be talking about a lot today. Um, and to challenge and expand ideas and perspectives on particular topics. Um, so there's a lot in, and I wish you could all see this massive wall of text uh, that's coming in. Uh, but <laughs> you can look in here. <laughs> Sometimes you have to enterprise in the classroom, especially with tech. We're, we're learning a lot today. Uh, but the reason why we asked this question is, uh, I think when we were talking about this topic and the value of bringing uh, dialogue in the classroom and creating opportunities for students to disagree with one another and to hear from each other, that there are two different levels that we wanted to think about. One is how to take those moments and really have students learn from those opportunities. Being able to hear what others thinks is, think is not necessarily learning, right? So what is that bridge that you can create for your students to get there? Uh, and then secondly, as these uh, educators right here definitely know, and we'll speak to is there are a lot of small movements in the classroom that bring your students there and may, might not always be seen. It might not always be visible, but they're certainly important. Um, and that's what our goal is today. So we're going to kick off with uh, some snapshots and give the panelists an opportunity to talk about a little bit about their classes. So, Amy, I'm going to start with you. 
Yeah, so I'm the course director for a massive course called Responsible Conduct of Science. All graduate students in year two and year six are mandated to take this course. And this is basically a course on teaching them about uh, science research and ethics. And uh, the overall goals are to understand and apply responsible conduct to students' research, but also to foster a collaborative community that engages in discussion and research around research ethics and responsibility. Um, our graduate students, normally, they join their program in year one, and by year two, they're in their laboratory, and they mostly only interact with the folks that they are doing their biomedical research with. So this is a wonderful opportunity, not only for us to hopefully create a very ethical workforce, but also for them to learn how to have discourse and discussions with a variety of other scientists from other fields as well. Um, our curriculum is case-based, so we, our students do do a lot of readings, but also they do a lot of, a lot of case-based, a lot of role-playing as well, um, and uh, it, that has been really good for us. So they, we, we also have over 30 facilitators for this course, and they are all biomedical researchers, and so we encourage them also to bring in the real-life cases that they've experienced as well. Thank you so much. We're hoping you could speak a little bit to you. Uh, what you teach your students are, and overall what the goals are. You could highlight, for example, a particular activity, a um, classroom moment that you would like to foster or create in your class that involves these kinds of challenging situations. Yeah. Um, so we have multiple modules for this. I just taught um, authorship and misconduct like 15 minutes ago um, <laughs> for one of the sessions. Uh, but the, the module that is really sticky for our graduate students is on identity and scientific community. And this focuses on bias, discrimination, and power dynamics and how that affects um, the advances in biomedical research. And I think that this is a really sticky topic for them because we have a variety of individuals in these courses from a variety of backgrounds. Um, so we watch and discuss a movie called A Picture of a Scientist, which focuses a lot on discrimination in biomedical research. And then they have to work through case studies, uh, dissecting each of the player's role in that case study. And I think a lot of times this hits ho home for them because we have case studies with many different types of identities, hopefully, so that we um, can provide uh, an experience that would be relevant to them. Um, the takeaway is for them to know how to report misconduct, but also emphasizing um, how we can prevent this in the future. And so this has been kind of a, a difficult place because a lot of emotions arise from these experiences. Folks are also um, if we have created a trusting community, which I'll go into later about how we establish that, um, it, it makes our students very vulnerable as well. And some of them will be sharing out. So, so the, that's the type of module that um, can create some really interesting discussions and discourse in our classes. But also, I think when you're discussing ethics in general, people are coming from different experiences as well when it comes to that. So with your with your students, so you mentioned the cases. What are your personal goals for your students in in this? Yeah. So one, um, some of our STEM students don't really get to ever work in case study. Yeah. So just learning how to read a case study, learning how to discuss that. Um, something that we use heavily in this course are community agreements. So before the course even begins, students can anonymously contribute to a community agreement specific to their section. And then on the first day, they learn how to have a discussion, even just on how they want to have discussions. And unfortunately, many of them, depending on the undergraduate institutions that they've come from and the experiences they've had, they may not have had an opportunity to say, you know, I'm quieter in class and I would really appreciate the more extroverted folks to take a step back if they're taking over the discussion or uh, a really beautiful one that I just read last week when I was conducting this course was I would like all of us to learn each other's names, which is really powerful when you are going to get into uh, hard discussions around ethical behavior and discrimination and the best ways to communicate science and, and how to, to face a difficult decision. So, um, so those are just some tools that, that we use um, around this. 
Thank you. And I saw Matt smiling when you were talking about teaching students how to uh, be scholars of a case that I think you bring a really wonderful point up of when you are bringing in something new of a new way of interacting with material learning that students might not necessarily know how to do it. And so going back to the foundations of almost teaching them how to learn within this space is something that might seem trivial, but ultimately really small, but important. All right. Thank you so much, Amy. You are. How about you? So I said teach about medicine and health in America with migration focus. And for this conversation, I'm going to think about the medicine and health in America broad lecture course. So I get students from first years to fourth years who are interested in what they think is medicine and science and really want some beautiful progress narrative. We used to be backwards. Now we have science. We fixed everything and we are in the future. Um, and and that, that's what they come with. And I have many pre-meds who haven't had the opportunity to actually think about science and medicine as a social system. So having to force them to take a step back and think about this thing that is a social practice where communities come together, make agreements, think about how information is going to be disseminated, and that there's no such thing as objectivity. There's no such thing as some transcendental body that exists and fell from the sky, that all of these are historically contingent things and have changed over time is a very big challenge. Okay? Um, because they are so committed to this progressivist narrative of things are bad, we're backwards, we used to bleed people, now we don't bleed people anymore. So a lot of my challenge is to reintroduce, like I said, the social, the cultural, the political, the economic into this system to say that this is not divorced from the rest of the world. This is, in fact, exactly the world. And medicine becomes just one space in order to see all of these other social dynamics refracted. So how can we reorient from this kind of model of heroic, success into the complexities that go into these social systems. So that's kind of the broad overview of how I think about this. And then, you know, how does power really influence the ways that medicine operates? Why is it that we want to believe that this system of science and medicine has some kind of magic that rises above? Why do we give it the value in society that we do give it. And so to denaturalize all of that, I think can be very disorienting for students. Um, and so a lot of how I think about this process is to move very, very slowly. Um, and as a historian, my tools are to use the evidence of sources as my way of trying to persuade students of this argument. So how do I actually take them through, not just telling them, hey, science is X, Y, and Z, or medicine is X, Y, and Z, but, and it's not a good or a bad thing. This is also another big problem that we run into is the question of, does it work? Is it good? Is it bad? And so to shift the frame of question asking to say, let's look at this advertisement from 1910 for Listerine. What is it trying to do? What is it trying to argue for? Who is selling it? Who's buying it? Why are they doing that? How is this object operating in the world? And so shifting some of the questions into that, let's, let's kind of use these source-based materials to, to ask these questions, I think is um, one of the strategies that I tend to deploy quite a bit in order to get them away from this science equals magic. Um, narrative. I love that. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious about the students reception. So I, I am coming from the hard sciences. So the idea of, you know, there's some truth out there that exists independent of whether or not it's within a society, those biases should not feed into my hard science. Uh, I suspect that there are students coming in med students who have a similar sort of background. So I'm curious, like, what is this spectrum or diversity of response for your students to this? 
it's it's challenging for that exact reason because there is like you're saying there is this commitment and i was a biochem undergrad so i i understand this coming from this perspective and thinking about this thing but once you i think introducing them to the history of you know actually carbon dioxide okay yeah that's a thing but there were decisions about how that came to be the thing that it is i mean one of the the papers that we read in this course that just blows their mind is about the egg and the sperm and how the sperm has this we talk about it as you know that's aggressive and it's seeking and all this, and the egg is this passive thing and recent scientific uh, scholarship has actually inverted that a little bit to say no the egg is what sort of vacuums up sperm etc but to take these students who have done work in the natural sciences and say why does a cell get imputed with these kinds of characteristics this is a cell how does it get to be aggressive and go seeking and all of these things and how do those things mirror the ways that gender is organized in society and so like i said it's a slow it's a slow process but i think having the the showing um to be very much a part of the work and kind of deflecting the showing onto sources or other things as well so it's not just me saying hey you're wrong and how you're thinking about this but to say look at the evidence that i have accumulated in order to try to persuade you of this thing. I may not succeed, but I'm going to at least try to persuade you. Love how you framed all of the, both the article and the, the primary sources, having something concrete to frame a difficult discussion around, right? Instead of throwing a topic out for people to provide their own opinions around, to give something that's a little more neutral for, for the start of that conversation. Thank you so much. Matt, how about you? Okay. Is this one working? Yes, it is. Great. Um, so first, I just, these were so wonderful. I, I, Amy mentioned name, um, knowing each other's names. And we have this lucky gift at the business school that we have name cards in front of every seat in every class. And those students know each other pretty well um, coming in. And that does create so much more space for connection. So I can only imagine teaching a group that has none of that and how, how you try to get over that hump. Uh, and then Aram's point on history, I think maybe the single most intellectually broadening course I took as an undergrad was a history course I had to take because it was the only one left in the distribution requirements. But it was exactly this. It was showing you the thought process over time and how people got to a decision about the Vietnam War that we all came in with a certain view and then we all came out being totally. So I'm, I'm so glad to hear both what you said. Um, I teach a course called The Role of Government in Market Economies at the Business School. Uh, it sounds a little bit more like a Kennedy School course, actually, when I say it that way, but it is about economic policy. And we have a lot of students at the business school who are very interested in uh, the role of the state relative to the role of the market. And I often use this tagline that economics is where the rubber meets the road on society's biggest debates, right? So you're going to have an immigration policy, even if your policy is no policy. And the policy you have shows the values that you've chosen to have as a society. And so it's a teaching economics can sound kind of dry from the outside, but it's actually an amazing opportunity to, to confront some of the hardest topics uh, that we have to talk about. And so that's what we try to do. So within that class, is there a particularly sticky topic that yeah. If it's all, you can There's just pick few. one. <laughs> There's a few. I mean, that's part, like I said, that's part of the joy. We talk a lot about inequality. We talk a lot about tax policy. We talk um, about education and healthcare and the environment. So things on which, you know, actually at the business school, we're fortunate we have still a pretty wide range of views on some of those core economic trade-offs. And so we can get a lot out. I guess I mentioned immigration maybe in my um, tee up. So I'll, I'll talk maybe briefly about that. Um, Obviously, that's a supercharged issue. Our student population is 35 to 40 percent international students. So immigration is a very live issue for some of them personally, uh, many of them personally, even if they're maybe second generation or, uh, or beyond. And the way that I try to get at that one, uh, because they're generally quite um, pro-immigration, I guess you'd think our students, right? They there's complications to that. They tend to be at the top end of the socioeconomic spectrum, and those people tend to benefit from immigration. So it's you have to be careful with that. Um, but what I try to do is I try to push all the way then, right? So in the class, we go all the way forward, then why not open borders? 
And in fact, there's like amazingly powerful economic arguments for open borders. Like you can go really far and, and philosophically too, you can push them really far. If they, if they start to hem and haw about, oh, I don't, I don't know. You can say, well, what if I offered this? Or what if I offered you this? And you can go, go, go. And then you start to see them get a little bit uncomfortable with going all the way. And then what, you try, what I try to do is unpack, okay, where's your hesitancy coming from? Some of the arguments don't really hold up. Uh, and then they get to something that they can feel somewhat comfortable pushing back against open borders with. And I think that's a way to just open up that conversation in a way that otherwise doesn't really happen. Otherwise, it's like the campus is very pro-immigration. And now you can start to at least get some push and pull on both sides. I really love uh, they're taking an opinion or voiced uh, side and really pushing it to have them think through what that means and what their own personal boundaries are uh, and to think deeply into that. All right. Wonderful. Uh, so I'm so happy that all of you are coming in from such distinct points of, of teaching, which is kind of the goal for our panel, right? To, to show that all of these things touch such a huge range of education across the university. Uh, but we have a couple questions, so we're going to ask them that touch upon uh, the in-class strategies on facilitating conversation, uh, even thinking through potentially the activities or assignments that you have them do outside of the class uh, in recognition that a class is an ecosystem. It's what happens in the class and outside of it. Uh, but first, we'll start with in-class discussion strategies. Uh, can you share a time when a discussion seemed surface level, but you were able to shift it into a deeper learning opportunity? And what specific steps did you take? So uh, a challenge that we have with the course that I direct is that we have 30 sections. And so in a way, we want to make sure every graduate student has a similar experience. I joke like I'm like the McDonald's of responsible conduct of <laughs> science, but like we want everyone to have very similar experiences despite who their facilitator is. And so we actually do do facilitator training. So I bring in, you know, like 15 facilitators at a time begrudgingly because they have other things to do to tell them how to teach a class that they're probably experts on because they are R1 researchers. Um, and what we do is um, with our discussions, we actually let our students go surface first. So we let them just kind of simmer on top at the beginning. So for example, I was subbing in for another instructor just now we like to do these in person. Unfortunately, this one had to be on Zoom. And, you know, you open up the discussion just with, uh, we were talking about uh, poor, um, misbehaviors in the laboratories, specifically around um, data and, um, you know, like d doing some shady things with your data. And, uh, you know, you just open it up with, what are your experiences? What have you observed or what have you heard of, right? Like, well, my friend told me, right? Like, that's a safe way to do that. And, and again, we have already built a community in this classroom to create this feeling of, of somewhat trust. And I always come in like, you know, I don't know these PIs from anyone else. They don't name anybody, but you can kind of talk about your experiences. And I think that that just starts to open up the doors a little bit to then getting to the point of, then we do some role playing and getting into, well, why do we make the decisions we make? Why do you think this character did what they did? If you were this person, would you make the same decisions? What power dynamics do you feel when you were playing the grad student, the postdoc, the, B, the PI or the VP of research, right? And so we really, um, like you, it's kind of a slow roll. We also spend 90 minutes together, so it's a longer class. But I, I think for some of these harder discussions, we have to give our students the time and the space if we have it. I understand some of you don't have that in your classes, but, but if we can, and we also have smaller class sizes too, which allows for this to really start to dig deep. Because I have so many facilitators as well, I scaffold the questioning. So all of our, everyone does the same cases or we give them a choice of three, depending on the class and what, what they're feeling. I'm, I'm all about power of choice in my classes. Um, but also we kind of scaffold the questions too. So like, let's hit those surface questions first and then start to dig a little bit deeper as we go and start really finding those as we heard um, 
from Matt was just like, how do we get to almost that discomfort and understanding where does that discomfort lie? What does that mean? Because we are creating the next generation of our workforce. And so for me as a biomedical researcher, of course, I want you to be doing this ethically, but we can't just assume that these decisions were made in a vacuum. There are other pressures, power dynamics, et cetera. So for us, when we're getting into these discussions, um, I allow them to kind of hang and skate on the surface for a little while, not too long, but just to get them all comfortable in speaking up and also making it more relevant for them. Thank you. Matt, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, okay. I'm, sorry. I'm trying to mix it up, but so I think I caught thoughts, you off guard. So many thoughts. I love so much of what you said. Actually, we just led a session at HBS about affirmative and uh, listening or validation and listening. And I think I hear echoes of what you're saying there, which is when you're in these conversations with people, at least our students often want to jump straight to problem solving or pushing back or asking questions. And the first step is just to say, make it really clear you heard what they said. And even if you don't agree, you really heard them because then they can move forward. And so they, I can imagine that surface level establishes some of that um, trust, I guess, at some level, then they can move forward. Um, I guess I was, you talk about sort of techniques to go deeper, and this is going to sound really banal, and it echoes something I said this morning, but I think it's the single most important thing at HBS that Bharat and I uh, enjoy, which is just going for the hardest question you can imagine, and and not settling until you get to the hardest question, because it's um, it's a hard thing to do, actually, like as it, but it's very intellectually enriching, um, but before, right when I'm walking into the classroom, I ask myself my cold call, and like if I have a killer answer i know it's the wrong one like i really like right like you really have to make sure that it's hard uh and then you get to the deep stuff so speaking of hard issues um i think one of the most difficult that i contend with in the classroom is to think about race and how race and medicine and science operate and there's you know, there's this kind of fluency about, oh, yeah, there are these social determinants of health. And, and you have, and there are these differences, and you have different outcomes based on this. And then you ask the question of, but what is race? And then you just hear silence. You're like, okay, is it biological? Is it social? What, give me more, give me something. And it's, it's very similar to what you said. There's an a fear and an unwillingness because this category has accrued so much meaning, lack of meaning. It just kind of floats around as this empty signifier in the world and in fact can mean anything to a lot of people, however they want to use it. And so part of what I what is, is challenging is that students want to believe that science and medicine are value neutral and that they are that, you know, science and medicine exist here. And then issues of, you know, race, gender inequality, they're added on to this system. And so what's very difficult for me and, and hard for them to accept is that I go through this, you know, historical and scientific understanding of, no, this is, in fact, in ex this co-constitutive, science and medicine and racial science all come together, have emerged together, and the legacies of these things are what we see in the statistics that you, know, you find today. And so how do you get to that point? So one of the, the kind of, that really gets them is there's a spirometer, which is measures your lung capacity. And spirometers that are used today have two buttons. And one is a button that is for race correction. And one is a button for gender. So when you go into a doctor's office, a pulmonologist, they decide based on whatever they want, either you report or they just decide based on some visual cue what you are. And they press a button because there's some assumption that if you, and it's predominantly for people who identify as black. So if you're black, the idea is that you biologically have a different lung capacity than somebody who's white. Okay. So you introduce this to students and, and something about that feels a little bit weird and they don't exactly know what to do with it. And you say, this is the practice today. This is literally embedded in the machinery that is used today. And then I kind of have to do the work to say, 
there's a reason that this came to be. And it is based on justifications for enslavement from 1850 and using lung capacity and differences in lung capacity as some kind of alibi for why black bodies and white bodies are different. And I can show you historically over time how this idea has been sustained and continues and shows up in this machinery. And so in the same kind of having to contend with this is, is just to say that, okay, you know, it, it's, very, it's much easier, or not easier, it's always very difficult, but to really force them to, to follow the argument, follow this line of thinking, show them that, okay, this person in you know, 1850 who is cited with this thing actually continues to be cited in contemporary scientific papers. And I can show you the citational you know, history and then you see why this shows up in this practice. So this is not a question of good or bad, but it's a question of understanding what are the historical antecedents that have produced this thing and what are the kinds of commitments to maintaining that as the practice. Um, and that's very, it's a hard conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. I think a, a theme across all of you is asking the right questions that show students the value of this conversation, right? It's really showing students, this is why we're talking about this, which they might not necessarily have bought in yet. So bringing in the right questions is, is really key. And indeed, it's also an element of trust. Trust the process of engaging in these really tough questions by themselves and trusting your peers, you know, creating this uh, social norm where it's okay to engage in questions, tough positions, intellectually, rather than with personal convictions feeding into it. Uh, so I just want to take a moment and remind you that on your table, there is a QR code. If you would like to submit a question for our speakers, or if you want to submit a challenge that you have faced in the classroom, either you've currently faced, anticipating facing, or you worry about, uh, and if you want to include your name to elaborate on it, please do so with that QR code. It should be open now. Sorry. Can we just ask a question? Yeah. I am okay with that. If you have a really burning question that's relevant as they're speaking, we can do that. Um, yeah. Comment and question. So when I think that's fabulous, what could you commit? Uh, my thought about it in relation to saying, asking people what is race, because race actually isn't. A thing about racism is very real, so you're a lot of um, But so I had a comment. Um, when you were talking about, when you were talking about talking, sharing bias, having those conversations. And I'm wondering so, in, in being a chief diversity officer, I'm doing a lot of facilitations. One of the things I ask in, facil in facilitations is what is the bias that you learned when you were a child? from your family, um, how would they teach you one thing, one bias, and how would they teach you to be biased? It's an interesting way to help people align, because a lot of times people are like, I'm not biased, of course not me, right? It's an interesting way to help people align themselves, everyone individually with their own bias. But to my question is, I'm wondering how you get to this place of um, the discomfort um, and helping people understand where their discomfort lies with these issues. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps it's in, in helping people interrogate why they have attention with said issue, whether it's about race or discrimination, I think we're talking about life. But are there some particular strategies that you use to help people get to a discomfort? Um, because I find that that is a way you can get to whatever people are avoiding.